Welcome everyone uh, to Rumanji Zen Monastery. Uh, my name is Shokan Weinkoff. I'm the abbot of the monastery. And uh, this is our 20th year of being here in uh, Decorah, Iowa. Uh, a Japanese monk who came to the Midwest, his name was Dainin Katagiri, and he founded the Minnesota Zen Meditation Center. And uh, in coming to the Midwest, five years after he arrived, he, he, he wanted to establish a monastery and ended up buying land in southeast Minnesota, uh, which eventually was closed after his death. And he died in 1990. Kategori Roshi wanted to establish a monastery in the Midwest for training of American priests. So that's our primary role. And of course we've been open to the public from the get-go. Uh, and uh, in the tour I'll kind of give you a little history as we kind of made, made our way. So this first building here uh, on your right as you come through the entry gate is called the Kuin. And the Kuin is a residential office, kitchen, dining room building. So it's got many functions. There's two levels, a residential function, you know, for uh, guests on the lower floor. And upstairs, there's some teacher rooms and the kitchen, the office, and the dining room. And this statue behind me here was donated uh, from Japan to an American priest. Uh, who retired and didn't have a successor, and he asked me if we would want uh, the statue of Avalokiteshvara, or in Japanese, sometimes we say Kanzeon, or Kanon. All those names are the same. And that is a manifestation, a sort of uh, what we would call the Buddhist compassion. Um, so it's been really great for uh, this space. Over here we uh, have, these are pictures of the Buddha's lifetime. The Buddha was born 500 BC in northern India and um, basically lived to be 80 years old. And um, the Buddha uh, had uh, 16 major disciples and they continued and then Buddhism came from uh, India into China around the 7th century and and then from China to Japan uh, in the 13th century when there was a Japanese Zen monk named Dogen who traveled to China and was five years in China and brought back the Soto Zen lineage. Uh, there were five major lineages that came down through China historically and uh, so uh, Dogen transmitted the lineage through two monks named Sozan and Tozan. So, um, this is a character here of the, uh, we are Ru Manji, which means Dragon Gate Temple. And this is a character, uh, as the sign below says, Ru is dragon. So, dragon in uh, Chinese mythology is always a great creature, you know, a great being, you know. Including compassion, even though he had a fiery, you know, kind of look to him. Uh, but uh, Rumanji, there's there's a story. I'll just tell you that real briefly. 
The story is about uh, there's a place in the ocean where huge waves repeatedly rose, and only the the fish that could pass through those waves actually became dragons, and uh, they still look like fish, but. Uh, the fish who could pass through those waves became like dragons inside. And uh, so the dragon, and it was called the Dragon Gate. So this monk Dogen says, well, what is the Dragon Gate and where are those waves? And basically he, his teaching was, those are the waves of everyday life. Can you deal with day-to-dayness and, you know, what's under your foot and what comes in your life with some equanimity without being tossed by your, our likes or dislikes. Uh, so that takes really fortitude. And uh, fortitude you don't learn from books, you learn from dealing with uh, the waves of everyday life. So we all become dragons, you know, to the extent that we live our lives. So. Okay, this is our uh, kitchen. Uh, so it's it's a commercial ki kitchen, pretty fully functioning, you know, with everything we need. Um, we do uh, weekend sessions. Sessions are uh, you know a Friday night, Saturday, Sunday retreat. During COVID nineteen, now uh, we have suspended activities until further notice. Uh, but for those weekend monthly sessions, uh, we'd have 15 to 20 to 25 people sometime. Some of this kitchen, even the old stove and sinks, uh, came from an old Hardy's restaurant that went out of business in Decorah. And so we used a lot of like recycled type of things. Even the lumber in this building was from an old granary. It was torn down in in uh, Decora, and we pulled nails for two years. Uh, but all that lumber was recycled lumber in this building. Now we're going into the hallway. So the buildings are connected in Japanese style. This, the monastery was built under uh, sort of a Japanese, Chinese architectural layout for traditional monetary, monastery buildings. So it's kind of like a thousand year history of this sort of format or layout. Uh, so the hallway here takes us over uh, to the main hall. On our way here, I'd like to show you out the window. Um, this is uh, the bell tower out here in the courtyard. This is a bell that we, we made ourselves. We didn't buy it from a catalog. Uh, and it started as a flower pot that was turned upside down and we extended it with a piece of tin and then we used potter's clay to make all the little designs on the outside. And then bought 400 pounds of bronze from a bronze manufacturing company in Cleveland, Ohio, brought them back as nuggets, you know, bricks of bronze in the trunk of someone's car, and took them to Minneapolis, to a Stillwater, Minnesota, up there near Minneapolis, to a foundry. And they poured the bronze 1800 degrees and poured it into a cast that they had put up around the model that we had made. So the model is the core of, of this cast. So then they cut the cast, took, took that apart, took the model out, the, the entry, the, the pot, the flower pot still is in our entryway, put the the mold back around and poured it with 1,800 degree, you know, 400 pounds of bronze, and this is what came out. So this is your traditional bell tower at a monastery, and it's hung, it's it's hit, you know, before services, and also to mark the different times of the day. 
you know, like morning, noon, evening. Uh, so let me hit it for you and you can get a feel for, you know, what that's like. And uh, So it works out pretty good. And over here is the entry gate. So this is kind of, we say, a dragon gate, you know, at Tent to the Monastery, all those temples have an entry gate that you're passing through. So... So this is the uh, monastery uh, build, main building. We call it the Buddha Hall. The statue up there is uh, it was carved by one of our priests uh, who lived up in Bemidji, Minnesota, Shivatin Bob Kelly. And as I mentioned before, uh, the Buddha was born in northern India. He never claimed any kind of divinity or divine inspiration. Um, he just looked at life. If you sit down and just take take a look at where you are, where where are we really? It's like we can start to see how interconnected we are, you know, to the earth. We eat from the earth, we live on the earth, our environments on the earth, you know, part of the earth's atmosphere. So we are all of that, and we are each other. Um, you know, our lives touch each other, and for good and for bad. Uh, but it's like what we call me or separate, we are separate from each other. But that separateness is really so inclusive. So we talk in Buddhism about oneness. And the oneness is that universal sort of pulse that we all are products so the Buddha's teaching is, if you see that oneness, then we should live our life with some compassion. So that's, for me, it's, this is like the basic kind of teaching of, the, of Buddhism. It was not a denominational religion, you know, it was a way of living based on wisdom and compassion. And if you see, have the wisdom, then that wisdom is automatically, you turn it over. And that's a matter of day-to-dayness. To be compassionate with yourself, with others, with your living situations, you know, uh, with your garden, you know, with your compost, you know, dealing with day-to-dayness. So that is monastery life, to teach that, you know, and to start opening up and get out of yourself start tuning in to everydayness. So that was the Buddha's way. So the service is to, just to honor not just the Buddha, but the plaque over here on the left says 10,000 ancestors. So that is uh, 10,000 ancestors is just all those beings who grew in a human species to live more a life of compassion rather than just me. You know, sort of like, I am, you know, I want to be kingpin, and I, you know, want to have this. And it doesn't matter what happens to anybody else. So the more I can amass, the better it is, you know. So it's to get, to have a little more wisdom to see that if we all work together, you know, it makes such a So all those beings who kind of lived in that way, we are products of them. So morning service is to bow in appreciation, to, to just uh, express that. And it's a form of prostration. Uh, you know, we 
which looks foreign to start with, but it's a gesture that's it's kind of like lowering your head to the earth, which is to realize to express your interdependence with all beings. And um, so that quality is what serves. And then there's a chanting of sutra which were some of the teachings of the Buddha um, that have come down through history. And, and also, the incense that's offered, it's also to express appreciation at the beginning of the service. But it's also offering yourself for the benefit of all beings. So the service is like rededicating yourself each day, each morning, to, you know, to be citizens dragon to pass through the ways of that day. So uh, so that the idea of service is like to bring yourself with an attitude of mind for living uh, based on wisdom to see our interconnectedness with our parents, with our grandparents, with myriad generations of not just in this culture but all many cultures have So this is the Buddha Hall, and, um, and I'd like to take you back behind the altar uh, because there's also, a, every temple there in Japan has a small founder's altar uh, with all the sort of previous abbots. Uh, so let's go back there and I'll show you that. Okay, so this is uh, this is the founder's altar, and uh, this statue is a statue of Kadgar Roshi, and this was his picture. Uh, so he died in 1990, and uh, and on the left, on the other side over here is uh, Narazaki Iko Roshi. Uh, Narazaki Iko Roshi was the abbot of a monastery in Japan called Zuyoji. And that was the monastery that I studied at and was registered in for three years. And they had a satellite temple called Shogoji, and I was also I went all to both both places. So. But he died uh, 1996. So that these are Ehi's. These plaques are the memorial plaques called Ehi's. And over here we have three of our priests who have passed away with these uh, Shoshin Bob Kelly, who did a lot of work on the temple, and the, the monk who came with me uh, at the very beginning, Jikan Kondrik. Jikan Kondrik, it was one of Kedagiri Roshi's disciples and she was to be ordained by him, but he died before he could do it, so I ended up ordaining her. So she was our first vice abbot, and together we formed the Decora Zen Center as such, and then told people we were really looking for country land to build a monastery. So, and Fudo Kopang was one of our priests, and he just recently died, so. And these are a couple of founding members, Jean Young, who was one of our founding board members, and also uh, a brother of um, uh, Katagiri Roshi's wife, Tomoe Katagiri, uh, who died in Japan. So, so I just want to show you this. Uh, this is called the Buddha Hall Bell, which calls people to the morning service after the sittings, which happen in the next building we'll, we'll be going to. So this was a, an old propane tank. We cut it off at the bottom, welded a handle on it, and uh, but it makes a great, great sound.
kind of continues, and you know, until people come over from the Soto. It's a very expensive bell that probably cost something like ten dollars. <laughs> so, and that was for the spray paint. <laughs> okay, and I'd just like to mention we uh, we did solar panels here. And I know we're on the other side, I'll, I'll tell you about that. Uh, and also did geothermal heating and cooling from the get-go. So this was a five-year fundraising project and people really responded. Uh, so we are virtually fossil-free, you know, totally, actually, uh, with all of our utensils and things. So, so that's good, I mean. It's a way of, you know, we can help the environment and everything else. So. so, come on in. All those sodos have uh, a fish like this called hole. A hole. Uh, so this story is, this is an ancient Chinese story here, too. The story is that this fish heard that there was a precious pearl at the bottom of the sea. And he heard this from an old fisherman who happened to be a monk. So uh, the fish really wanted to get that, you know, precious pearl. So he dove down to the bottom of the sea. And when the fish, when he got down there, the fish saw that there were myriad pearls all over the place. So the fish grabbed one and brought it up to the surface, surface and then looked for this monk and he said, hey, what's the big deal? I thought you said there was a precious pearl at the bottom of the sea, but there are pearls all over the place down there. And the old monk said, yeah, well, the precious pearl, you know, is every moment, whatever's under your foot is the precious pearl. Everything is the precious pearl. The issue is, you know, can you pick it up and can you take care of it? Uh, not always the pearl you're looking for, but can you take care of day-to-day -day in a certain moment-to-moment? -moment? So that quality is Zazen. Can you take care of 24-hour uh, Sazen? Uh, anyway, it's kind of a nice story, but that, it's always in all those sotos you'll find this fish if you visit Japan or China. So this building is called the Sodo, and Sodo means monk's hall. Uh, so the priests who come and are in training here, um, they eat their meals, formal meals, on these platforms, on the edge of the platform. This is like a table. Each person has their own set of bowls, or given their own set of bowls. They're washed and uh, cleaned right here with servers. There's also on the inner area futons behind these cabinets, the, the curtains, so they sleep on the ton. And also this is the meditation hall where visitors and uh, monks both, you know, uh, sit together. So the, the visitors are in this outer area called the Gaitan, and uh, the monks are in the Nido. Uh, or the inner area. And the image on this altar is uh, Manjushri. So Manjushri is a symbol of all people who, who stopped long enough to kind of turn their light inward a little and just be one with Themselves and with where with where you are. So that's the instruction for this sitting or meditation. 
Technically, it's called zazen. Uh, zazen literally is like upright sitting. And uh, so that quality is to be alive in moment. Like, get out of your head a little bit. Instead of all your, our commentary about liking things, don't liking things, and this and that. Like, for, for a moment, you know, these, you know, 40 minutes of, of just to be one with where you are. It's like, settle down. Get there. Be alive in your life for those 40 minutes. But not just the 40 minutes on the cushion. Be alive with 24 hours outside. That's the issue. So this is not a means to something. It's just the beginning of a day, you know. And these are the first 40 minutes, so to speak. So there are many 40 minutes in a day. But can you be alive? So that is, uh, this is a traditional layout here in this inner area, in our area. Soto has literally a thousand year history through, through Japan, through China, and in, in India they, live, they practice more in huts and you know, smaller, you know, I don't even know all the history there. But uh, this Soto, they were building this to that satellite monastery called Shogoji while I was there. And I asked the architect if he'd have any chance he could give me a copy of the plans. I already was pacing it off because I knew when we came back, when I came back, we would be building Katagiri Roshi's vision to establish a monastery here in the Midwest. So the architect said, sure, I'd be glad to give you a set of plans. So this is the monastery that was built, well, I mean the Soto that was built when I was at that satellite monastery, Shogoji. That Shogoji was established by one of Dogen's disciples called Daichi. So his name Daichi, is, he was one of Dogen's eight main disciples. So it was very good to keep that temple alive. And the previous abbot died in that temple and there was no successor for like 17, 18 years, you know, so. Anyway, so that Shogoji temple 